All right, welcome back to Chapter 16, Respiratory Emergencies. Our overview is going to be respiratory anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology. Respiratory distress, pathophysiology of conditions that cause respiratory distress, meter dose inhalers, and small volume nebulizers. Age-related variations, pediatrics and geriatrics, and assessment and care uh, general guidelines. All right, case study. EMTs Jake Pratt and Paul Berg arrive at a residence and find a 62-year-old Margaret Brown sitting at the kitchen table, leaning forward on her hands to breathe. They immediately note that she is a thin woman with a barrel-shaped chest who is using accessory muscles to breathe. Despite an increased respiratory rate and increased work of breathing, Ms. Brown's skin color is pink. Jake notices a portable oxygen concentrator as well as a nebulizer nearby. What is your general impression of this patient so far? What additional information will help you complete your general impression? And what immediate action should EMTs take while completing the primary assessment? I encourage you to pause this video and write these questions down. Okay, respiratory distress is frightening and potentially life-threatening. You must be able to recognize signs and symptoms of respiratory distress and provide immediate intervention. Okay, we're going to go over the anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology of the respiratory system. Uh, excuse me, the respiratory anatomy. The respiratory system consists of the upper airway, lower airway, and the lungs. Normal breathing, normal respiratory rates are based on a patient's age and medical history. Certain findings are consistent with a person who is breathing adequately. Abnormal breathing, conditions that impair gas exchange, increased space between the alveoli and pulmonary capillaries, lack of perfusion of the pulmonary system from the right heart, fluid, blood, or pus in the alveoli. When we assess breath sounds, we need to oscillate breath sounds to provide additional evidence of breathing difficulty. We oscillate by using our little stethoscope to do so. Uh, to achieve the most accurate breath sounds, it is important to oscillate in the appropriate fashion. Have the patient sit upright and use the diaphragm end of your stethoscope over bare skin. And here we go. In the front, over the mid-clavicular lines, above the uh, about mid-sternum area, there's the mid-axillary line, just above the nipple line. Mid-scapular lines, just below the scapulas. All right. Abnormal breath sounds are wheezing, ronchi, and crackles. Ronchi sounds like uh, air moving over a bottle if you were to blow over it, like a Coke bottle or something. Inadequate breast sounds lead to hypoxemia, an SpO2 less than 94, and hypercarbia. Hypercarbia, hyper means high. Um, that's going to be, carbia is referred to carbon dioxide, so we're going to have a high levels of carbon dioxide in our system. Hypoxemia leads to cardiovascular fa failure and hypoperfusion. Untreated inadequate breath sounds, uh, excuse me, untreated inadequate, inadequate breathing leads to death. Common findings in respiratory distress, complaint of shortness of breath, restlessness, increase or decrease pulse rate, changes in breathing rate or depth, skin and skin color changes. Remember that cyanosis, when we're lacking oxygen, our skin color can change um, to go pale. And we get the bluing around the fingernails, mucous membranes, and the lips, and so forth. And, and, the con and also in the conjunctiva of the eye. Causes of respiratory distress. Narrowing of the bronchioles from inflammation, swelling, or bronchoconstriction. Bronchodilators can provide relief. Um, the bronchodilators that you can give, um, you can assist the patient with their meter dose inhaler, which uh, contains levalbuterol or albuterol. You can also um, administer albuterol through a small volume nebulizer if they do not have a uh, inhaler. Um, injuries to the head, neck, face, spine, chest, or abdomen can cause respiratory distress, cardiac compromise, and hyperventilation. Um, abnormal, ab excuse me, abdominal conditions can cause respiratory distress. Dysfunction of the respiratory system by mechanical disruption of the airway, lung, or chest wall. 
uh, stimulation of receptors in the lungs, inadequate gas exchange related to a ventilation of or perfusion disturbance. A breathing disturbance can be categorized in one of the in one of three ways: respiratory distress, adequate rate and tidal volume, patient is compensating, administer oxygen to maintain the SpO2 of 94% or higher. Consider CPAP. Respiratory failure, rate, tidal volume, or both are inadequate. Assist in ventilations with the bag valve mask, provide supplemental oxygen, and patient may deteriorate to respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest is a cessation of respiratory effort. That means it has stopped. It leads to cardiac arrest in minutes. And we must immediately intervene with the bag valve mask, ventilations, and supplemental oxygen. There, may, uh, there are many causes of respiratory distress, but assessment and basic emergency care is the same. What that says, what that means is, is that we don't need to try to be doctors out there and take too long with our assessment. We need to go ahead and do our assessment and uh, treat the patient as the same. Okay, emphysema and chronic bronchitis are construct chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So here we see a normal alveoli. And here we see uh, emphysema, which is a, a, a inflammation of the alveoli, which gives us a decreased uh, surface area. Then we have uh, chronic bronchitis, which uh, will get, lead to mucus plugs and inflammation of the, the bronchioles. So they're two different things. So it's always good to ask your patient. When they say, I have COPD, you need to ask, do you have chronic bronchitis or emphysema? Emphysema, the pathophysiology, uh, lung tissue loses its elasticity, walls of the alveoli are destroyed, disruption in gas exchange occurs, the patient purses their lips while exhaling to create their own, excuse me, their own physiologic peep. Basically, they put their lips together as they're blowing, um, and it, and it kind of try the peep means that it backs up the air into the lungs and tries to open up the alveoli. Uh, and they, they'll do it like subconsciously. They won't. They won't realize they're doing it. A patient usually complains of shortness of breath or upon exertion. Emphysema assessment signs and symptoms. Many of the signs and symptoms of emphysema are similar to those listed for respiratory distress. This is called the tripod position. Um, there's Grandpa there, and he's got his cigarette burning, and he's not feeling well because he's in respiratory distress. Uh, because of his COPD, um, and he's still smoking them cigarettes. But this is the tripod position. For whatever reason, this uh, allows people to feel better when they're, or yeah, feel better when they're suffering with COPD. CPAP or BiPAP may be used to improve oxygenation, and as you can see, that's a very uh, invasive device. Um, it has to go around the head, and it's CPAP, remember, stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, so it's continuously pushing air down the mouth and into the airway. And it can be uncomfortable for your patient because they're trying to breathe in and out when that's just pushing the oxygen down. Chronic bron bronchitis pathophysiology, swelling and thickening of the bronchi and bronchial lining, alveoli remain unaffected by the disease associated with smoking, narrow bronchioles reduce airflow, and reduce lung ventilation with increased lung perfusion. Chronic bronchitis assessment, you'll hear a productive cough. Uh, the increase in bronchial obstruction, there is a reduction in the residual volume in the lungs that can lead to bloating and cyanotic appearance. Emergency care for chronic bronchitis, same guidelines as any patient suffering from difficulty breathing. COPD patients can develop hypoxic drive. Maintain the SpO2 between 88 and 92%. Consider using CPAP. All right, back to the case study. Jake quickly notes the following as Paul applies oxygen by nasal cannula and begins asking Ms. Brown, Brown's friend some questions. Ms. Brown is in a tripod position using pursed lips, uh, pursed lip breathing. 
She is anxious and is able to speak three to four words at a time. Her respiratory rate is 28 with adequate tidal volume. Oscillation reveals scattered wheezing and ronchi throughout both lungs. Ms. Brown's SpO2 is 94%. The friend states that Ms. Brown has emphysema and has been more short of breath than usual since early this morning. Would you characterize Ms. Brown's condition as respiratory distress, respiratory failure, or respiratory arrest? What treatments may be appropriate for Ms. Brown? How should, you, how should treatments be integrated with plans for transport? Again, I, I encourage you to pause this video and write these questions down. Okay. Obstructive pulmonary diseases. Asthma. Increased sensitivity of lower airways leads to narrowing of the bronchioles and increased resistance to airflow, which uh, could be caused by bronchospasm, edema of the airways, that's swelling of the airways, increased mucus production, and acute severe asthma or status asthmaticus is prolonged, is a prolonged life-threatening attack. So all you Harry Potter fans uh, in this class, don't be trying to throw the status asthmaticus spell on people, okay? It's not nice. All right, so conditions co contributing to airflow resistance and asthma. Uh, we have the bronchioles, the bronchus. We see that mucus accumulation, edema of the bronchial lining, uh, mucus plugs, and then the AVO line. You see how they're affected because it's restricting airway and gas exchange cannot take place. To assess asthmatic patients slow, uh, with a slow onset, 80% of the cases of asthma have a slow onset. Deterioration over six hours to several days, more prevalent in females, usually triggered by upper respiratory tract infection. Learn the signs and symptoms. A rapid onset. 20% of the cases of asthma have a rapid onset. Deterioration in less than six hours, more prevalent in males, usually triggered by allergens, exercise, or stress. Learn the signs and symptoms. Okay, still on your assessment for asthma. Rapid onset asthma, more likely to result in death. Be prepared for this patient to develop respiratory failure or respiratory arrest. Critically ill patients require positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen. Emergency care for asthma. Primary assessment interventions. Um, that means in your primary you need to treat this asthma. Uh, so we always treat life-threatening emergencies in our primary assessment. Supplemental oxygen to maintain SpO2 of 94% or above. Allow sufficient time for exhalation when providing positive pressure ventilation. Consider CPAP and a beta-2 agonist, which would be, ding, 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 albuterol or levalbuterol. Especially if they have a meter dose inhaler. Pneumonia, the pathophysiology of pneumonia. Acute infectious disease of the lower respiratory tract causes lung inflammation and fluid or Pus filled alveoli leads to a ventilation disturbance and poor gas exchange. Here's uh, pneumonia for you. It is filled those alveoli sacks up with fluid. No kind of exchange is happening here. To assess pneumonia, generally the patient generally appears ill. They are probably going to have a uh, fever because they have an inf infection. They may complain of fever or severe chills, and signs and symptoms are going to be uh, usually uh, coughing up green mucus, definitely a cough. Whenever you listen to lung sounds, you're going to hear crackles and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, treatment for pneumonia, not usually associated with severe bronchoconstriction. Supplemental oxygen to maintain the SpO2 of 94% or higher. Focus, uh, follow protocols for use of beta-2 agonists and CPAP. Definitely want to get them to the hospital because they can give them the antibiotics and things like that for your um, for, for pneumonia. A pulmonary embolism, pathophysiology. Pulmonary embolism is obstruction of blood flow in the pulmonary arteries. So several factors increase the risk, including immobility, usually caused by a blood clot. And there we go. There's a pulmonary embolism. So blockage of blood flow in the arteries. This is not the uh, airway. This is the, art, the, the, the blood vessels, not the airway. Okay. 
Assessment would be sudden onset of unexplained dyspnea and chest pain, signs of hypoxia with normal breathing sounds and adequate volume. Include lower leg assessment for DVT. That's going to be DVTs where you um, would you see swelling and you and you put your you squeeze their legs with your fingers, with your hand, and when you release it, your finger impression is still there. Treatment of uh, pulmonary embolism, open the airway and administer positive pressure ventilation, maintain an SpO2 of 94% or better, include lower leg assessment for DVT. All right, click on the item that best describes emphysema. If you chose A, you would be correct. Emphysema is characterized by destruction of the alveolar walls with loss of elasticity and distension of the alveoli which impairs gas exchange and increases resistance in the airway. All right, other conditions that cause respiratory distress, acute pulmonary edema, pathophysiology, often due to cardiac dysfunction, results in hypoxia, occurs when excessive fluid collects between the alveoli and pulmonary capillaries. Gas exchange is impaired. All right, here we go. Fluid that collects between the alveoli and the capillaries. Uh, the fluid may also invade the alveolar sacs. So we look on the left, we have normal gas exchange in that blown up picture. And on the right, we see there's fluid between the alveoli and the blood vessel or capillary, and it, it hinders that gas exchange. Acute pulmonary edema assessment. Crackles are a sign of pulmonary edema. Oscillate lower lobes. Cardiac symptoms does not occur with ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's what that means. ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Anxiety, combativeness, and confusing, confusion may complicate your assessment. To treat it, positive pressure ventilation may be necessary. CPAP may be beneficial. Administer oxygen. Keep the patient in an upright sitting position. Spontaneous pneumothorax, pathophysiology, sudden rupture of visceral lining of the lung with uh, partial collapse of the lung. Gas exchange is impaired. Risk factors include smoking, connective tissue disorders, and COPD. All right, so we see um, a picture here of the spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, causes of which air enters the pleural cavity and travels upward, beginning the collapse of the lung from the top. And we see it right here. That air travels up and pushes the lung down. Spontaneous pneumothorax pathophysiology, primary spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in patients who have no underlying lung disease. Secondary spontaneous, spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in patients with, in which there is underlying lung disease. Your assessment, um, it'll show with sudden onset of shortness of breath without evidence of trauma and decreased breath sounds to one side. When seated, absent breath sounds will be heard in the apex or the top of the lung. Your treatment, if positive pressure ventilation is required, use the minimum tidal volume necessary. CPAP is contraindicated, meaning CPAP will hurt this patient because CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure and it will continuously push air airway into that pleural space and will not allow that lung to reinflate. Hyperventilation syndrome, pathophysiology, is associated with emotional upset, ex excitation, and panic attacks. Breathing is faster and deeper than normal. Carbon dioxide levels decrease. Muscle cramps may occur in feet and hands. I will tell you that I treated a 15-year-old girl with this syndrome. Um, her and her boyfriend had just broken up, and she had a panic attack and started to go into hyperventilation syndrome. Your assessment, the patient with true hyperventilation syndrome is an emotionally charged situation, or they're in an emotionally... Ugh, I can't talk. They're in an emotionally charged situation. Like I told you, that girl had just broken up with her boyfriend. So sad. Teenagers. Treatment. Calm the patient and get them to slow their breathing. Administer oxygen if the SpO2 is less than 94%. Epiglottitis pathophysiology is an infection of the epiglottis that leads to swelling that can obstruct the airway. Males and smokers are more commonly affected. Also, young children will get this a little bit more than adults. And there we go, the inflamed epiglottis. Um, an epiglottis, if we, if we know that whenever um, we swallow, it blocks, tops off our trachea so that we don't um, 
swallow food down our airway. Your assessment of epiglottitis, history of upper respiratory infection, usually for one or two days prior to onset. Inspiratory strider is an indication of an almost completely occluded airway. Administer oxygen. Keep the patient calm and comfortable. Do not inspect the airway. If ventilation is required, squeeze the bag slowly. Pertussis pathophysiology is a contagious disease characterized by uncontrollable coughing followed by a whooping sound. Severe complications can lead to death. It's preceded by signs and symptoms of upper respiratory infection. The assessment in three stages to recover. Stage one, symptoms of common cold or upper respiratory infection. Stage two, coughing continues to worsen to the point that medical care is sought. Stage three, the re recovery stage usually, uh, stage three is uh, your recovery stage and usually gradual and takes several weeks. Pertussis is nothing to, uh, to mess with. Your treatment would be to place a surgical mask on the patient because they have an infection and you don't want to catch it. Position them comfortably, supplemental oxygen, SpO2 of less than 94%, and expectorate any mucus so they might um, cough up mucus. So that's why you need to have a mask. That's why you need to wear a mask and put a mask on your patient and maybe a face shield. Cystic fibrosis is a hereditary disease affecting the lungs, digestive system, and sweat glands. Death occurs in young, in young adulthood, usually from pulmonary failure. Production of thick mucus leads to repeated respiratory infection. Poisonous exposure, pathophysiology, inhalation of toxins leads to hypoxia by various mechanisms, including upper airway swelling, displacement of oxygen in the atmosphere, damage to the alveoli, and effects on the body upon entering the bloodstream. Your assessment for poisonous, poisonous exposure, Critically, determinants, um, you need to see how long they've been exposed and, and is it in an open or enclosed space, what, meaning was it ventilated or not. Exercise great personal caution when entering the scene of a potential toxic inhalation because you don't want to be become the next patient. Uh, your treatment will be uh, limit exposure to the toxin, open the airway, position of, put the patient in a position of comfort, Oxygen at 15 liters per minute via a non-rebreather. Positive pressure ventilation if needed. Gather information about the poison. Viral respiratory infections include colds, the flu, and bronchiolitis. Usually mild, but significant infections can occur. Assess for, for and treat both hypoxia and respiratory distress. Maintain an SpO2 of 94% or greater. Supplemental oxygen and occasionally mechanical ventilation can become warranted. Contact ALS for medical administration in patients with potential deterioration. Okay, back to the case study, or this is your case study conclusion. Paul locates Ms. Brown's medications, finding that she has both meter dose inhalers and medications for use in small volume nebulizer. Jake uh, questions Ms. Brown about her recent use of the medications to determine if she is el eligible for additional treatment, as Paul consults a drug reference to confirm the nature of the medication. Jake consults medical direction and receives an order to administer medication from a meter dose inhaler as Jake assists Ms. Brown with the medication. Paul completes baseline vital signs, then they assist Ms. Brown to the stretcher and prepare for transport. Jake reassesses Ms. Brown en route to the hospital, noticing some decrease in wheezing and a respiratory rate of 24 with an SpO2 of 96% on 4 liters of oxygen. All right, meter dose inhalers and small volume nebulizers. Their beta-2 specific bronchodilators can be administered by MDIs or SVN. So that's MDI is a meter dose inhaler. SVN is a small volume nebulizer. A beta-2 beta two bronchodilator is going to be levalbuterol or albuterol. Bronchodilators can uh, cause relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle. Medication is dispensed as an aerosol or mist at, that the patient inhales. Most bronchodilators begin to work almost immediately. Again, here's your meter dose inhalers. The one in the middle, the green one, is uh, usually what you'll see. But you may see some children that have the spacers. Remember, the spacers, after you shake up these inhalers, you must shake these inhalers violently for about 30 seconds. After you do that, you would puff the inhaler into the spacer and then instruct the child to breathe it in. This is your small volume nebulizer. At the top, you see it with a T mouthpiece. 
Um, but also uh, the, 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 the albuterol goes in here in this cup. And you can also take this cup and attach it to a non-rebreather. You take the reservoir bag off, you put the albuterol in here and attach it. And uh, that way you don't have to tell the patient to take their mask on and off. Medications include albuterol, metaproteranol, isoetherine, bitolterol, mesylate, salmeterol, zineof, <laughs> I, I really can't pronounce these names, but you can look at them, ipertropium, levalbuterol, and perbuterol. Indications that a patient needs uh, a nebulizer or MDI, the patient is in respiratory distress, Patient has physician prescribed medication and approval from medical direction. Contraindication, the patient is not responsive enough to use the medication. You can't just uh, take an inhaler or a nebulizer and put it on your patient and hope they will inhale it if they're unresponsive. Um, the medication is not prescribed to the patients. Please don't give medication to people that they're not prescribed. So. You know, if you're on scene and a couple of teenagers, one of them's in respiratory distress and the other one goes, hey, he can use my inhaler. No, he cannot. Do not do that. You have your own albuterol in the truck. You can give it to him. Medical direction has not given permission. So if they don't give permission, do not administer that to your patient. The patient has taken a maximum number of doses. So we don't want to overdose. I will tell you there's no toxic amount of albuterol these patients can take, but we still don't want to over do it with them side effects of your um your uh, bronchodilators are going to be tachycardia tremors nervousness dry mouth and nausea and vomiting okay signs of improvement during the administration of cpap you'll see a reduction in the complaint of dyspnea dyspnea is trouble breathing you'll see an improved spo2 reading almost immediately normal respiratory effort that means they're working in it on their own and they're breathing normally and the, the patient becomes more alert. Okay, administering medication uh, by meter dose inhaler. We're going to consult with medical direction for an order to administer medication. Check to make sure the medication is for the patient, that it's, it's the proper one to administer, and that it has not reached its expiration date. Please do not administer expired medication. We're going to shake it vigorously for at least 30 seconds. Instruct the patient to inhale slowly and deeply for five seconds. As the patient begins to inhale, depress the canister. Remove the inhaler and instruct the patient to hold breath for 10 seconds or for as long as it is comfortable. Instruct the patient to exhale slowly through pursed lips. See those lips? Those are pursed lips right there. With a spacer. Okay, you're going to... Remove the spacer cap, attach the spacer to the inhaler mouthpiece, uh, depress the medication in the canister to fill the spacer with the medication, instruct the patient to inhale slowly and deeply. Nebulizer medications. Complete your primary and assess the patient's pulse rate and breath sounds. Select the correct medication and consult with medical direction for an order to administer the medication. Add the medication to the nebulizer chamber. Assemble the nebulizer. Coach the patient to inhale the nebulized medication from the mouthpiece. Reassess the patient's pulse rate and breath sounds. All right. Click on the medication that is not a beta-2 agonist used in the emergency treatment of patients with respiratory conditions. All right. If you chose Advair Discus, you would be correct. Advair discus, you've seen the Advair commercials. It is a combination of a long-acting beta-2 agonist and a steroid and is not intended for use in a respiratory emergency. Advair, not for emergency use. Advair is a long-acting beta-2 specific drug that also contains a steroid that is used as a maintenance drug. People with COPD and stuff like that, they have to take this every day as a maintenance drug. Advair is not to be used as a rescue inhaler for the patient experiencing an acute asthma attack. Pediatric patients, respiratory failure is the most common cause of respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. Common causes are upper airway obstruction and lower airway diseases. Respiratory distress or failure in the pediatric patient, assessment and care, 
Scene size up in primary assessment. Look for clues to help rule out trauma. Breathing difficulty can be spotted as you form your general impression. Assess mental status, airway, breathing, and circulation. Secondary assessment for distress. Signs of respiratory distress typically precede failure in the infant or child. Recognize early signs and symptoms. Retractions appear to be more prominent in early respiratory. And acknowledge when they begin to use the intercostal muscles to assist in breathing. Uh, secondary assessment, um, and during your assessment care, failure, uh, you want to you see bradycardia, hypotension, slow, fast, or irregular breathing, and a loss of muscle tone. Emergency medical care, allow the child to assume a comfortable position. Do not remove the child from their caregiver. Apply supplemental oxygen. If breathing becomes inadequate, remove them from the parent. Establish an open airway and begin PPV. If the child does not tolerate the mask, have the parent hold the mask near the child's face. Uh, upper airway obstruction from a foreign body disease or disease, um, croup and epiglottitis. Uh, so what they're saying here is you're going to see if you, you might have an upper airway obstruction from a foreign body or disease. Um, so you need to be leery of that because kids like to put things in their mouth. Croup, they may have the croup and epiglottitis, which is also uh, an infection in the airway. Reassessment, transport an infant or child with difficulty uh, breathing, provide reassessment en route, and be prepared to intervene. Geriatric patients, respiratory distress has many causes in geriatric patients. Respiratory function may already be diminished. It can progress rapidly from respiratory distress to respiratory failure. Uh, your scene size up. And primary assessment, look for clues to help rule out trauma, labored or noisy breathing, the tripod position, like we talked about earlier, unresponsiveness, and additional signs and symptoms will be discovered as you contact the patient. Uh, respiratory distress can quickly proceed to respiratory failure. Elderly patients decompensate rapidly. That means their bodies give out and it's just going to stop compensating. It is difficult for the geriatric patient to move the rib cage. Respiratory arrest is a condition in which there are no respirations. A pulse is still present. You must immediately intervene and begin positive pressure ventilation. Emergency medical care. Put your patient in a comfortable position. If the SpO2 is less than 94% or respiratory distress, hypoxia, hypoxemia, or poor perfusion are present, administer oxygen via a nasal cannula. Reassess en route to the emergency department. Assessment and care general guidelines. Your scene size up. Look for clues to the condition. Scan the scenes for a possible mechanism of injury for trauma. Scan the scene for alcohol, which is common, a common contributor to choking and upper airway obstruction and aspiration of vomitus. During your primary, form a general impression. Assess the mental status, airway, breathing, and circulation. Patient in respiratory distress is commonly found in a tripod position. During your primary and mental status, look for restlessness, agitation, confusion, and unresponsiveness. Their airway, assess the airway for any indication of a complete or partial obstruction. Breathing, look at the chest rise and fall. Listen and feel for airflow. Oscillate lung sounds. Determine approximate respiratory rate. Shallow breathing is an indication of inadequate breathing. Inadequate breathing, provide positive pressure ventilation. Adequate breathing, administer oxygen. Assess the circulation, inspect the skin and mucous membranes. Assess the heart rate. Establish priority, a patient with difficulty breathing is a priority patient. Consider ALS backup and rapid transport. Get an OPQRST, a history, evaluate the chief complaint, allergies, medications, history of respiratory or cardiac problems, or any hospitalizations for chronic conditions. Signs of deterioration during the administer of CPAP, so your patients can get worse during CPAP. Uh, so look for increasing respiratory rate. Lethargy means they're getting really just like really tired and weak. Patient more exhausted and fatigued, speechlessness, abdomen moves, uh, abdomen moves inward with inhalation and outward with exhalation, and a decreased SpO2 reading. MDI administration do's and don'ts. 
Do instruct the patient to breathe in slowly and deeply. Do be sure the patient is breathing in through his mouth. Do shake the container for at least 30 seconds before removing the cap. If the MDI has not been used for a couple of days, prime the MDI by pointing it away from the patient and depressing the canister a couple of times. Do depress the canister as the patient begins to inhale. Do coach the patient to hold his breath as long as possible. Do use a spacer or pref uh, preferably a, a valve holding chamber device if available and the patient is used to it. Don't allow the patient to breathe in too quickly. Don't allow the patient to breathe in through his nose. Don't administer the medication before shaking the canister. Depress the canister before, don't depress the canister before the patient begins to inhale. Don't forget to coach the patient to hold his breath as long as possible. And the patient may experience a variety of side effects from the medication. The most common are an increased heart rate, tremors, and nervousness. More detailed information about bronchodilators and other side effects are listed. Side effects are listed in figure 1611. Okay, your secondary um, assessment during respiratory distress, during your physical exam, look for cyanosis, look for jugular vein distension, tracheal deviation and retractions, oscillate the lungs, check vital signs of pulse oximetry, look for signs of difficulty breathing, evaluate the level of difficulty breathing. During your physical exam, signs and symptoms perform, perform an accurate assessment. The severity of shortness of breath does not directly correlate with the level of hypoxia. Emergency medical care for inadequate breathing. Establish an open airway, begin positive pressure ventilation, and transport expeditiously. For adequate breathing, administer oxygen, assess baseline vitals, determine if the patient has an MDI, meter dose inhaler, place the patient in a position of comfort, and complete the secondary assessment. During your reassessment, look for improved or diminishment in respiratory distress or respiratory failure. Assess the mental status and airway. Provide positive pressure ventilation if needed, and the patient with breathing difficulty is a, considered a priority patient. Monitor respiratory rate and tidal volume, and closely monitor the SpO2 and monitor the heart rate. Okay, EMTs Troy Steele and Oscar Herzog are caring for a five-year-old Sarah Gross, who has a history of asthma and began having difficulty breathing at a daycare. Sarah is coughing, and the EMTs can hear wheezing without using a stethoscope. Sarah appears a bit pale, but is alert and cooperative. Sarah's teacher hands Oscar a meter dose inhaler, telling him it belongs to Sarah. What anatomical and physiological differences should EMTs keep in mind when assessing a patient of Sarah's age? What information is needed before the EMTs consider administering medications by meter dose inhaler? Again, I encourage you to write these questions down. Pause this video. Troy asks the teacher for the original packaging for the MDI to confirm the medication belongs to Sarah and also confirms that Sarah has not already received any of the medication. Because of Sarah's age, protocol requires Troy to contact medical direction for an order, which he does. After hearing the report on Sarah's condition, the physician orders the use of the MDI. What are the steps Troy will use in administering the MDI and what will Troy look for to determine the effect of the medication? All right, case study conclusion. Troy coaches Sarah through two inhalations of the MDI en route to the hospital. Troy reassesses Sarah and finds that her wheezing has nearly resolved with only faint, scattered expiratory wheezes heard on auscultation. Sarah's respiratory rate has decreased from 24 to 20 per minute. Her SpO2 has remained steady at 98% and her heart rate is has increased from 88 to 96. All right, our lesson summary. Respiratory emergencies range from respiratory distress to respiratory failure to respiratory arrest. There are many causes of respiratory emergencies. Infants, children, and geriatric patients can present differently than adults when experiencing a respiratory emergency. No matter the underlying cause, respiratory emergencies have many signs and symptoms in common. EMTs must know when to administer oxygen and must recognize when to prevent, provide positive pressure ventilation. Respiratory compromise is the most common cause of cardiac arrest in pediatric patients. Some patients with histories of respiratory conditions have meter dose inhalers or small volume nebulizers to deliver beta-2 agonists, which act as bronchodilators. Infants, children, and geriatric patients may present differently than adults with respiratory problems, and the EMT must be prepared to intervene properly, promptly. 
Reassessment is a critical step in the management of patients with respiratory emergencies. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.